Good evening and welcome to Queen's Health Sciences Research on the Road. I'm so pleased that you've come to join us tonight. My name is Jane Philpot. I have the tremendous privilege of being the Dean of Queen's Health Sciences and we're really pleased to have this time with all of you tonight. You've managed to get here through the snowy weather and I think that you will be quite glad that you've come. I wanted to first of all acknowledge this beautiful place that we are in here in uh, Ticoronto, which is the traditional territory of many First Nations peoples. As some of you who live here and enjoy this land on a regular basis will know, this is the traditional territory of a number of different Indigenous peoples, including the Huron Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and of course it is also the homeland to that is covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississaugas of the Credit and continues to be home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples even to this day. So uh, it is a great pleasure and privilege that the rest of us who have come here or our ancestors have come here uh, from many places around the world can enjoy this beautiful place on the shores of Lake Ontario. So why are we here tonight? We're here to talk about health sciences research. And these talks, this is our first Research on the Road event, and it's inspired by a series that we've been hosting in Kingston, Ontario, called the Sank Asset Research Talks. Has anybody heard of the Sank Asset Talks or watched any of them online? A few of you perhaps have, excellent. So hopefully after tonight, you'll be intrigued by what you hear and you might go online and watch some of the other Sanka set, set talks. Um, these are talks that we have gathered. We have uh, five or six events a year in Kingston. We videotape the events and we post them on YouTube. We've now had over 50,000 views of our researchers telling uh, the world about the great research that they're doing. And they have been so popular and people have enjoyed them so much that we thought, let's go on the road. So you're our first on the road event tonight. Um, so this is about storytelling and you're gonna hear some great stories tonight. We're trying to show how Queen's Health Sciences researchers are really making a difference in the world, helping to make the world healthier, having an impact in our communities, of course, not just only in Kingston, Ontario, and not even just in Toronto, Ontario, but literally across the country and around the world. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker. And we have two, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Annette Hay. And Annette Hay is a, an associate professor of hematology and oncology at Queen's University. She is what we call a clinician scientist. And for those of you who aren't in the health sciences world, uh, you may not know that that means that not only does she do incredible groundbreaking research, but she sees patients. In fact, she sees uh, patients who are very much in need of her clinical services. She deals with patients who have cancers, cancers that affect the blood, the bone marrow and lymph nodes. She also is a senior investigator in one of our most uh, impressive research groups in, at Queen's, and that is the Canadian Cancer Trials Research Group. They, we literally have thousands of researchers around the world who are networked through the Canadian Cancer Trials Group that Annette and her team are part of, and they develop new therapies uh, for cancer, but most importantly, they test those therapies and make sure that they work and that they can be, be used safely and effectively. So Annette's going to be telling you about some of the most impressive new therapies that are being tested, and uh, she'll tell you exactly how that happens and how we can best serve the people who need Need those therapies the most. So I'm very pleased tonight to introduce you to Dr. Annette Hay and her talk is called On Gratitude, Impatience and Cell Therapy. Annette. Thank you and I have one other piece of really good news. We have the best Dean in the world. Attitude. Impatience. Do you consider them mutually exclusive? That thankfulness and a willingness to wait are likely characteristics that run together, as may a lack of both. I've been thinking about this. I'm Pollyanna over here, playing the glad game, grateful for everything. 
The feeling of the sand between my toes on the beach, the wind in my face, even the nervous anticipation of talking with you today, and the time that you've taken to come here and listen. I'm also impatient. And this was a recent realization for me. And on announcing to my husband and teenage daughters in the kitchen that patience was not one of my greater virtues, they paused, looked at me carefully, then kindly said, well, at least you have insight. <laughs> I'm impatient because our time is finite. And this is where joking must be put aside. As a cancer doctor, I see it daily. And every one of us has been affected by cancer in one way or another. Every moment matters when you have cancer, especially an aggressive, fast growing one. So as Jane mentioned, I'm a clinician scientist. I see patients, I do research. And one of the things I'm especially excited about is a brand new way to give some people with cancer more time, more life. And I'm gonna make you listen to me tell you about it. So imagine a world where cancer can be cured by a person's own immune system. Instead of chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation, allowing a person's own immune blood cells to do the work. It's not the way the world looks right now, but we're closer than you might think. I wanna take you on a journey, excite you by the extraordinary progress that has already been made open the curtains for you to peer into what the future could look like and challenge you to consider how we collectively can shape that future. I'm talking about something called CAR T cell therapy. That's right, CAR. <laughs> CAR T cell therapy is short for chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. It's a revolutionary way of treating the cancer using the body's own immune system. It starts with a person with cancer sitting in a comfortable chair with a small tube in their arm. Over several hours, some of their lymphocyte blood cells are removed and put into a special bag, kind of like this one. This bag is then flown to a large factory. There's one in California, one in New Jersey. There, the cells are engineered to make them recognize the cancer, transforming them from ordinary blood cells to CAR T cells. The newly engineered CAR T cells are multiplied to create millions of cells. They're then flown back to the patient's hospital where they are reinfused back into the body. The entire process, including manufacturing and shipping, takes around four weeks. That's about a month of anxiety, waiting for the personalized treatment to arrive. No two bags of CAR T cells are the same. Everyone is unique to an individual patient. And CAR T cell therapy has saved lives, curing some people with certain types of leukemia and lymphoma in whom all other treatments, including stem cell transplant, didn't work. It's also showing benefit in other cancers like myeloma. Now, new treatments take many years to develop. First, research is done in a laboratory. Then, treatments that look promising are tested in people in clinical trials. Clinical trials are a choice that people are offered and they can choose to participate in the research or not. You may be surprised to hear that Kingston, yep, little Kingston, is the major hub of cancer clinical trials in Canada and in 40 countries around the world 
And it was this internationally recognized expertise at the Canadian Cancer Trials Group that invited me to come to Queen's, to Canada, from Ireland via Scotland 12 years ago. And I've never regretted it for a moment. It's a great place to be. Thank you for having me. Um, there are often strict eligibility criteria for people to be able to enroll in a clinical trial, to be sure that they are safe and the researchers can tell if the treatment is working. Need a moment? <laughs> I would like to tell you three stories about patients I have looked after. Now I'll warn you, there is sadness, but there is also joy and hope. My motivation for getting into cell therapy began with a lovely person with a horrible cancer. It just wouldn't go away with all the treatments that usually work. This was a few years ago when CAR T cell therapy was just emerging. And there was a clinical trial she hoped to participate in. Unfortunately, the cancer grew too big, meaning that option was taken away from her. They died leaving behind a devastated family and a community who relied on them. Now, we don't know if the CAR T cell therapy would have worked, but the loss of the chance to try was difficult for all to take. And this focused me to consider what can we do to give whoever comes next a chance? Fast forward two years. This second story ends well, but it was a hair raising ride. Another beautiful person with a cancer that kept coming back and a resourceful husband. He pitched a small tent in her hospital room in Kingston and camped out there for a month. Now, by this time, CAR T cell therapy was approved in Canada but there was very limited capacity to deliver it. So she was able to travel to the US and get treatment. While the CAR T cells were being infused, they calculated the cost of the fluid running into her arm. $375,000 US dollars for the little bag. 16,000 Canadian dollars per milliliter. Now, unfortunately, it didn't work for her as well as we hoped. She went on to have a couple of other treatments, is now in remission, back to work as a teacher, doing fabulously. Learning points here. New cell therapy products are needed because the ones available now don't work for everybody. And how can we make it more affordable? Fast forward another six months. It's Christmas. I'm on call. And there's a young man in his early 20s in the hospital ward, desperately sick. His CAR T cells are being manufactured in the US. We're waiting those terrifying four weeks for his personalized treatment to arrive. Because by this stage, we could now deliver CAR T cell therapy in Canada, which was fantastic. But every single day waiting was uncertain. As his cancer raged on, he developed life-threatening blood clots in the lungs and serious infections. Now, thankfully, he made it and it worked. And he's in complete remission now, getting on with life and the things you have fun doing in your 20s. But during that wait, the story could so easily have had a different ending. How can we make it faster? Let's shorten that timeline by doing it here. We can do all of this in Canada. Point of care or decentralized manufacturing of CAR T cells at specialist centers in Canada is possible. 
It's being tested as an alternative approach in clinical trials right now. We hypothesize that it may provide cell therapy to more people more quickly and more affordably, and with broad societal benefit, including to the healthcare system, the economy, and the manufacturing sector. While for some, CAR T cell therapy is akin to a miracle, there are serious limitations to be addressed. I've outlined the wait time, but some don't survive. The cost and the fact that it doesn't work for everyone. Additionally, side effects such as those affecting the brain can be severe. We, along with others, are doing research to address all of these areas. I'm particularly focused on trying to figure out how to make cell therapy less costly, how to treat more people with the same hard-earned taxpayers' dollars. I want to be really clear about what I am not saying. I am not saying this research should be rushed. It's important to take the time to do it right. When we conduct clinical trials, we do them believing that the new thing we are testing may make things better. A new treatment will let people live longer. A new medicine may have less side effects. A new process may be faster and more affordable. These are research questions. And by definition, before launching the clinical trial, there must be equipoise, meaning no one knows the answer for sure. As the clinical trial runs, we are looking really closely at the data as it comes in. If there's a signal that it's not working, it's essential we recognize that quickly, stop and reassess direction. If the new treatment or process is better, it's essential to have strong, reliable data that organizations such as Health Canada and the Food and Drug Administration can review and be confident in the results. That's the first essential step to new proven therapies becoming available to patients. It's important to take the time to do this research properly and safely. I am not seeking the holy grail of immortality. All of us will die sometime. I'm amazed by the gratitude and thoughtfulness people can show in their final days. One of the parts of my job that I simultaneously dread and revere is the final conversation. As a hematologist, I get to know the people I care for well, often building a relationship over several years. Their shared laughter and shared tears, depending on the day. At some point, there may come a mutual realization that the end is close. The conversation when we sit down and this is kind of funny, silence the cell phones and look into each other's eyes and reflect, it's one of the most meaningful. Early in my career, I cared for a firefighter. He had had several different treatments for his cancer and they'd stopped working. There was a new treatment emerging that looked really good in the clinical trials and I tried to get it for him from several different sources. I didn't succeed. And I tried to hide my disappointment from him, and I didn't succeed there either. <laughs> he saw right through me. And he said, Thank you for trying. I am grateful for all the advances that have occurred up until now. They've given me a few years of good life I would not otherwise have had. Yep, there'll be more advances in future that others will benefit from. That's okay. I won't forget the lesson he taught me. 
He participated in a clinical trial testing a new possible treatment for his condition. He contributed to further understanding of his cancer for those who would come after him. While it's always nice to cure someone's cancer, I also take pride in setting people up for a good death, ideally when the time is right for them. When my time comes, I hope someone will do the same for me. In the meantime, I'll continue to work towards expediting testing and implementation of new promising treatments for those who are not ready to go yet, those who still have a lot to give to society, their families, and who desperately seek more time. This research represents a huge team effort. JFK's words from years ago still seem apt. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. CAR T cell therapy is a tremendous breakthrough against cancer. And for that, there is no limit on the gratitude of the thousands who have gained extra years of life as a result. And thanks we owe to the researchers who continued to pursue this approach even when it looked too hard to make it work. Cell therapy is in our future. I'm committed to play the part I can in expediting that future, testing new possible treatments and new means of manufacturing them it is only through making cell therapy more affordable that access to existing products will be expanded beyond the lucky few and new cell therapy advances will be enabled in cancer and in other conditions such as autoimmune disease and infection. There are many paradoxes in this world. Gratitude and impatience coexist beautifully and effectively. I am immensely grateful for the years of work that has gone into making cell therapy a reality. I remain unapologetically impatient to realize more progress. None of us know when our time will run out. Thank you. Who's proud of Queen's University tonight? I am so happy that we were able to share Dr. Annette Hay with all of you. And uh, I've heard this talk before, but it is always inspiring and impressive and makes me so proud of the work that is happening and so hopeful for the future and what will be accomplished through the work of Dr. Hay and her colleagues at Queen's and around the world. Thank you. Well, I have just a few announcements before we go on to our next speaker, and I'm sure you're eagerly anticipating the next speaker coming forward. I wanted to let you know that tonight has been made possible not just because of the hard work of our staff at Queen's University who organized this event, but you will be happy to know that tonight's event has been sponsored by the Kingston Economic Development Corporation, otherwise known as KEDCO. So a big thanks to KEDCO for sponsoring tonight's event. When we started our Sanka Set Research Talk series, we had three goals. They were communication, networking, and raising support. And so I hope that you'll find that tonight is all a part of that. When I arrived at Queen's University, I was stunned to realize about the incredible researchers that were happening, research that was happening there, and that the world didn't know enough about it. And we wanted to develop a series of talks so that more people could learn about the work of folks like Dr. Hay. And so it's an opportunity for us to tell our stories about our research. 
It's also an opportunity for networking. And I hope in the time that you've been here this evening already that you've met some new people. I certainly have, and I really enjoyed meeting some of you. It's a chance to be able to interact with people in the Queen's broader family. And so after our talks tonight, hopefully you'll have a chance to say hello again to someone else that you didn't already know. And finally, we put these talks together as an opportunity to raise support. So as I said to you, we have been taping our talks. You'll be able to watch these talks and others online. And the idea is to share with the world the amazing research that's happening at Queen's. We're really proud when organizations like KEDCO sponsor our events because it gives us a little bit of assurance that the community appreciates what we're doing. And all of our Sankaset research talks have been sponsored now, which is great. But we also know that sometimes people will hear a talk and they'll say, I'd like to support that research. And so please do share ta the talks online with your networkers, networks, and tell people about the research that's happening at Queen's. Uh, it doesn't happen for nothing, as you can imagine, and we're always thankful to let the world know what's happening and to look for opportunities uh, to be able to get support for the research that takes place. So with that, I'm going to move on to our second speaker, who is equally inspiring and has a whole different type of research. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Catherine Donnelly. Catherine knows a lot about community and she knows about the health benefits that community can bring. She would probably tell you that as you get older, community matters more than ever. It ha matters throughout the life cycle, but particularly as people get older. Dr. Donnelly is an occupational therapist and she is part of the School of Rehabilitation Therapy. Her focus of research is on aging and health. She is the director of a fantastic research group called the Center, the Health Services and Policy Research Institute. And she brings together people from across the schools within our faculty. So that's medicine, nursing, rehabilitation, therapy, and then even beyond our faculty to do research together on how we can improve health systems in the country. She has a particular interest in team-based primary care, which is a passion that the both of us share. And she has a specific focus on how older adults can be supported to age well in their homes and in their community. So she's going to tell you about a project that is delightful in its simplicity and yet has the potential to dramatically change the lives of people for the better. We're really privileged to have Dr. Donnelly as part of our team of researchers and educators at Queen's and I'm delighted to introduce her to you tonight and she's going to talk about neighbours helping neighbours age well at home. Dr. Donnelly. Thanks very much, Jane. It is just such a delight to be here today. Thank you. Eleanor Rigby died in the church and was buried along with her name. Nobody came. All the lonely people, where do they belong? Eleanor Rigby. I had heard that Beatles song countless of times, but it wasn't until I was a talk by a geriatrician on loneliness that I really listened to those words. Eleanor Rigby, it is almost certain if you pause and reflect, thinking about your neighbors, your families, maybe yourself, that you know yourself, your own Eleanor Rigby. As Jane mentioned, I'm an occupational therapist and health services researcher, and I spent a number of years working at the Queen's Family Health Team. And about 10 years ago, I was referred to a man that I will call Frank, and I'll tell you a story about him today. I received a referral for what was what I thought initially was home safety issues, pain management, mobility. He had a number of chronic conditions and it made it difficult to do the daily activities that he needed to do. He had troubles getting in and out of the bathtub. He had troubles walking around his neighborhood. He had troubles making meals for himself. Frank lived alone. He knew nobody in his apartment building except for the neighbor next to him, which was by name only. His wife had died a number of years ago. He loved to carve wood, and he had a whole room dedicated to his wood carvings. But money was tight, and he had difficulty doing the activities that he sometimes would like to do. He had one living relative who lived about an hour away who would come sometimes and help him take him to appointments or do some things around the house. 
but fundamentally Frank was lonely and he was isolated. So loneliness is a feeling that you have and isolation is the number of connections. Loneliness. We don't know the exact magnitude of the problem, but we think approximately one in three people are feeling lonely and maybe some of you here, particularly as we enter the holiday season. It's been called a global health crisis, a pandemic potentially. What we need to focus on. And we know that older adults are particularly prone to high and chronic levels. And our research has shown that since the pandemic, feelings of loneliness have changed. We now use the term social isolation as a average term that we never would have done before. The impact on loneliness on our health is, is actually startling, and you might have been hearing about it lately. Um, one of the stats that I find most shocking is that for those who have poor social connections, it's the same risk of an early death as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Humans are wired to connect. When you think of solitary confinement, that is a form of punishment, torture even. However, we know our society is less connected than ever before, and older adults are living alone in higher numbers, in part because our society is aging, but in part because our societies are also just changing themselves. Families are not living in the same cities, they're living across countries, provinces. And I recognize that many people feel lonely, but my research is specifically focusing on, focuses on aging and loneliness as we age. And that's what I'll speak to today. And that same building that I saw Frank in, I also saw Lee, I saw Tilly, Manuel, and each for different reasons. Sometimes they were falling, sometimes they had troubles with their day-to-day -day activities, but fundamentally each of them was lonely. And so while I would go up to the same apartment and I would see Lee on the first floor, I'd go to the second floor, see Manuel, and then I'd see Tilly on the eighth floor. And then I'd hop in my car, drive around the corner, and I'd see Joan living in a house by herself in a street with everyone living by themselves in a neighborhood that actually used to be filled with families that they had aged by themselves. So I knew each of them, but they didn't know themselves and all were feeling lonely at home. And that's not unusual in an apartment for people not to know each other. But as an occupational therapist, fundamentally as a health provider, we have to maintain confidentiality. So I had no real way to connect them, but I really wanted to introduce them to each other. I tried with dismal failure to create some community programs and I created walking programs in the wellness center, but, and then I'd invite them all with this idea that maybe they'd meet each other, but it didn't actually work out. So I continued to provide individual services to each of them, living all under the same roof, not knowing each other. And while lots of work has been done to describe loneliness, much less work has been done to think about what we can do individually, as a society, as a healthcare system to address loneliness. And so while we know loneliness shortens lives, we know that particularly from one very impactful study, the Harvard study on adult development, that followed 268 Harvard men, they didn't worry about women back in the day, starting in 1938. And they followed them over the course of their lives, they added wives in later on, 19 of whom are still living today. And what they found was relationships are protective. They found that men at 50 who reported the highest satisfaction with their relationships were healthiest at age 80. Taking care of your relationships is literally like taking care of your own health. We know that the UK, I don't know if you know this, but they have actually developed a ministry of loneliness. It's remarkable. And if you go online, you can read all about the things they do. And you may have noticed, or maybe it's just me because I'm focused on this, the US Surgeon General has made loneliness the focus of his next five years. Dr. Ruth, you might remember her from the 80s and 90s, she has made the topic of loneliness sexy and has named herself the Ambassador of Loneliness of New York. 
in Canada, we've had targeted funds mainly dealing with things like aging at home, but we have no sort of collective focus on loneliness yet, hopefully. Frank wanted to remain at home. He wanted social connections. But part of the challenge is the way our healthcare system's organized is we focus on individuals. We think of how programs can be directed to a person to help them live in their home. We don't think about how we can support neighborhoods and communities. So as a family health team, a number of us were actually working individually with Frank. We were providing individual services to him in his home, and we were able to manage what I would call the tipping point issues so he could stay in his home, but none of us addressed the fundamental issue, loneliness and his lack of social connections. So I'm an associate professor at the School of Rehab, and I was teaching a course in the Aging and Health program called Evaluating Age-Related Programs and Services. And one of the assignments that I had crafted up was that everyone was to go out and find a program in the community that was looking at supporting older adults. And one of the programs that one of the students had identified and worked with was called Oasis Senior Supported Living, or Oasis for short. And they worked with them over the course of the semester, so I would be reading about this program as it unfolded over four months. And all of the pieces came together as I was reading through the course of the semester. For Oasis is about building communities and bringing people together in the neighborhoods where they lived. And so I called Christine McMillan with a colleague of mine who's not here right now, but we work very closely together, Vince DePaul. And she invited us over for tea in her apartment over a couple visits. And she explained what Oasis was. She and, away, and a number of older adults living in a naturally occurring retirement community, and you may have heard this term, NORC, and if you haven't, you'll hear it now. A NORC is a, not an intentional place, but it's a geo geography with a, number, a high proportion of older adults living in it. And so again, it's not an intentional community, but it develops naturally. Like I had mentioned Joan earlier, living in a neighborhood where people naturally age in, in a community that they grew up in. Or it might be an apartment, for instance, and you might all think of an apartment close to where you live that older adults have naturally gravitated to because they're close to amenities. And NORCs, or Naturally Occurring Retirement Communities, it'll be a bug in your ear, they're gaining more attention because it's a, it's a, it's a thing that we can think about where services can be directed to where a number of people live. And so OASIS is about building social connections. It has three pillars. It has physical activity, socialization, and nutrition. And so it's about, again, empowering older adults who are living in a building and for them to think about what programs in those pillars that they would like. And Christine is an incredible advocate and is still living today, and she lives in Toronto. And she went to our local health integration network, the Lynn at the time, and she was able to receive funds to to have an on-site coordinator come into her building full time and support the older adults and bring the programs to the building. And so again, Oasis is focused about building social connections. It's not a health program, but we see it as having health outcomes. And so Vince and I thought to ourselves, could this, is what, was it just Kingston magic or could we expand this program broadly to other communities? More specifically, could we bring this to Frank's building? And so we worked with the Oasis um, Board of Directors and spent the next two years trying to find some funds to see if we could expand Oasis. And in 2018, we received just over a million dollars to expand it to five new communities, working with our partners at Western and McMaster. In that time, Frank continued to deteriorate and by that time, he was using a walker for all his mobility and was really feeling isolated and lonely, basically at all times, and had really struggled to connect with people around him. While we received that money, we spent the summer sitting and listening with the original Oasis, learning what those key ingredients were so that we could spread those to the other five communities. We also had a number of students, and they took census data 
that's open access. And they actually mapped all the communities in Kingston, London, and Hamilton to look at where those norks might be and where community buildings might be located in those norks. And if you're ever interested, we actually have a live map you can go on so you can see the norks that might be around your community. We found the building that Frank lived in and we actually called up his landlord. For Oasis is about a partnership with landlords who donate space. And those landlords can be anything from a not-for-profit, profit, we've worked with co-ops, and we're now working here in Toronto, and we we're working with a neighborhood and the, bank, the Toronto School Board who's, who's donating space. And we went to Frank's building and we started to develop and have information sessions. This was our very first time expanding, so we didn't know what quite we were doing at the time. We put notices all across the apartments and we held information sessions and we would put a pot of coffee on in the front lobby. And I remember thinking, if you build it, he will come. But I didn't know if actually Frank would come. But I remember that very first planning session. It was in a big room in a common area, you can imagine, in, a, in an apartment. And Frank came in in his walker at this stage. And he sat in the corner. He knew nobody in the apartment building, again, as I mentioned. But over the course of the next year, Frank developed a community. He went three mornings a week. They had developed a coffee and news chat. And once a week, he would bring his wood carvings down, and they would share, and he would teach others how to carve wood. Frank was 90 by then, and he had just lost his license. But he was now part of a community that helped him bring groceries to him and also had drivers around to help him out as well. almost got this memorized. <laughs> Oasis is about building a community. And so it's not about, again, having services brought to you and eat by yourself, for instance, Meals on Wheels, which is a wonderful program. But again, you have to eat by yourself in your apartment. It's not about bringing a, an exercise program across town, driving there and coming back on your own. In 2020, COVID hit. And so we were terribly worried about how the public health restrictions were going to impact Frank in terms of his own feelings. And again, Oasis is not a health program, but we had two occupational therapists doing a placement with us at the time. So they immediately developed a calling list and they would call people every day, remember back in those first early days of March. And then we started something you might be familiar with called Zoom. And we started Zoom meetings. And I remember our program manager, Simone, spending hours trying to teach Frank how to use Zoom, which he eventually did. But part of the expansion was not just to think about, could we expand Oasis, which we, we found out that we could, but we also wanted to research to learn the impact of Oasis on health, social networks, and how people used healthcare. We interviewed members in Frank's building, but we also interviewed members across the different Oasis sites. And we heard three broad themes. The first was, it gave people something to do and someone to do it with. We heard Manuel say, it gave him a reason to get up on Monday morning. He looked forward to the coffee so he wasn't stuck in his room. We also heard a theme that it made people feel that they were coping with life a little bit better. We heard statements that from, from um, Joan that it lifted her up to have looked forward to life. And lastly, we heard from people that it helped deepen and expand social networks. Over and over again, we heard about Oasis being almost like a second family. For Frank, Oasis became the family that he didn't have. And shortly after COVID, Frank was hospitalized, not due to COVID. And while he was hospitalized up until the day he passed away, he was receiving calls from the Oasis members. And he died in the hospital after a very short stay, surrounded by friends, being able to live in his home just as he would want. And like Frank, older adults resoundingly want to remain in their homes. 
And so we also wanted to look at, could Oasis help do that? And so part of our research has also been able to look at large data sets. And what we were able to do was look at Oasis residents who lived in the original building. And what we found is for those members who did go to long-term care, they were able to stay in their home for one extra year compared to older adults living in non-Oasis buildings. We also found that those older adults living in Oasis buildings had less use of the emergency department, they had less, fewer hospitalizations, and they used half the amount of home care services as people who were, who were living in non-Oasis buildings. We've been fortunate. We have been able to receive further funds to study Oasis, and we're in the midst of conducting a five-year longitudinal study to look at how social networks develop and change over time and how those networks influence health and well-being. We have also been extremely fortunate to receive funds from a generous donor to be able to expand to six new sites and further funds just recently from the federal government. So what started out as one community in Kingston, Ontario, is now expanded to 18 communities from Vancouver, multiple sites in Ontario, and now in Halifax too. But I'm smiling to myself now as our focus has, has really turned to sustainability, and that is our goal. We said to each community we started in that when we started, we would not end until we ensured they had long-term sustainable funds, and we have never left a, one of our communities. And we're in the midst of starting a not-for-profit, a Canadian not-for-profit that's going to be incubated at Queen's with the goal of sustainable communities. So as I was writing this, I was thinking it was with high irony that I'm standing here by myself talking about community and loneliness. <laughs> but truly, I am just standing here with many people around me, and I'm looking in the audience to our latest Toronto Oasis that just had their open house on Tuesday to 80 people coming out. And so a resounding success. So I am here on behalf of the incredible community partners, the older adults and the landlords that we work with. So I just, again, a nod, I'm just here, I'm nearly the conduit. And it's been truly one of the most gratifying work that I've done in my 30-year career as an occupational therapist. So I started today talking about Frank and loneliness. There is no special diagnosis to identify the feeling of loneliness. There's no magic pill or surgery to fix the feeling. But I can truly say that we together can solve this as a collective by thinking differently, by thinking about how we can support neighborhoods and communities, starting with the ones that you live in. So as you leave here today, I'm going to get you to think about who you first thought about when you heard the word Eleanor Rigby. And I want you to think about how you might reach out to them, give them a call, or better yet, pay them a visit. We too can start a movement in Canada and it can start here with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was absolutely fabulous. And once again, makes me incredibly proud of the work that you have done. And of course you and your incredible team, including Dr. Vince DePaul, and that it has spread well beyond Kingston to this big, beautiful city of Toronto, and even beyond that, it is making a difference in the lives of people and helping them to live long and well, which is fantastic. So I want to thank uh, Annette and Catherine. These are extremely busy people, uh, but they found uh, time in their days to be able to prepare for this talk and to be able to come down here and share this with you. I want to thank KEDCO for your generous sponsorship of and your support for Queen's Health Sciences all along the way. Uh, we are not going to have a Q&A, but our, both of our speakers are going to stay around for a little while before they head back to the beautiful city of Kingston. And uh, they're very happy to have a chat with you. So come on up and say hello to them and ask them your questions. Please take the opportunity to say hello to someone that you haven't met before in our audience. And uh, if you've enjoyed these talks tonight, we will make sure that you all get a link to the Sankaset series on YouTube. And you can sit there and do like my mother did. She watched them all in a row. <laughs> You can binge Queen's research. <laughs>